So good evening, my name is David Coleman. I'm director here at the Whitlow Collections. I want to welcome you to our event in association with the exhibition Cormac McCarthy, Unveiling a Literary Legend, uh, which is on view through December 19th. I hope you'll come and come back again, tell your friends and so on. Uh, Steve Davis, who's the curator of the Southwestern Writers Collection here, curated the exhibition. Uh, he was gonna introduce Peter, unfortunately he turned ill and couldn't make it tonight. He sent his regrets, uh, but it allows me to compliment him effusively on the exhibition. He did a wonderful job with the, with the show. Uh, this is the second exhibition we've had in association with the Cormac McCarthy Archives being here. Uh, the first one was in 2010, so now a few years later we've done it again. This one is organized more thematically and I think Steve has done a really terrific job uh, focusing on Cormac's uh, inspirations for writing, his extensive research uh, that he did to write his novels, his writing in the vision process, um, and then another section on uh, Cormac and the cinema. Since we've opened the uh, Cormac McCarthy archive in 2009, hundreds and hundreds of researchers have come literally from all over the world, uh, to pour over drafts, pour over notes. There is Cormac's uh, archive and then associated archives with it. Um, and it's just been tremendous. We have three researchers uh, just here this week. And many of them have made uh, marvelous and valuable contributions to our understanding of McCarthy, uh, which brings us to tonight's speaker, Peter Joseph who is really one of the most astute, uh, dynamic, and creative readers of McCarthy uh, that really that McCarthy is privileged to have. I can say that. <laughs> Strike me down. Come back. I dare you to come here. Strike me down. <laughs> Maybe I should take that back. Uh, Peter's a man of many passions, interests, uh, talents, and I could spend a long time introducing uh, the various parts of, of Peter. Um, he's an accomplished painter, actor, director, playwright, filmmaker, author. His paintings, for example, have been exhibited uh, across the U.S. and in several other countries. And he's just done so much on McCarthy. I think it's so appropriate that we have him here tonight. He's taken us beyond the texts. Uh, into Cormac's world, really. Uh, tracked down and met many of the people uh, who inspired Cormac's characters, talked to them, photographed them, gotten their stories. He's met others who've known Cormac when he was writing his novels and provided more insight into uh, McCarthy's writing process. He's traveled to the same places that McCarthy has, observing and recording uh, the very things that McCarthy has and done when he was writing his own novels. He's recorded conversations, made photographs, as I mentioned, painted and made a film, uh, co-directing the documentary, acting McCarthy, the making of Billy Bob Thornton's All the Pretty Horses. And he has published extensively on Corbett McCarthy's work, and I'm going to underline that again, extensively. Uh, we at the Whitliff Collections were proud to publish his book, Cormac McCarthy's House, Reading McCarthy Without Walls. This is not the book, but I'm holding it up anyway, because it's a lot like the book. We have uh, books for sale uh, that you can purchase. Uh, I think we have three of Peter's books that you can buy. There's going to be a signing after the talk, so I encourage you to pick one or more up. Um, previously to that book that we published with him, uh, he had written Adventures in Reading Cormac McCarthy, 2010. He's currently working, finishing up a third collection of essays uh, and conversations called Meditating McCarthy, Reflections on the Genius of Cormac McCarthy. Now Steve Davis, who I mentioned earlier, was going to introduce Peter, um, as I said, until he fell, uh, fell ill. And he wrote me this assessment of Peter. I thought I would quote Steve. <laughs> Peter's not out to deconstruct McCarthy or to privilege the critic above the artist. Instead, he's riffing on McCarthy, 
using his own creativity to engage the novelist to bring McCarthy's previously hidden aspects into clearer light. This is criticism as jazz, and it is a dynamic, wonderful thing to behold. And I'll just add here that, as many of you know, our motto here at the Whitliff is to instruct, eliminate, and inspire. And it's this last one, inspire, that really is probably closest to the heart of what we value and what we do here at the Whitliff Collections. And uh, you couldn't get a better person to exemplify inspiration uh, than Peter Joseph, who's been inspired by McCarthy's writing, and I know will inspire all of you, even you in the back, in turn. So, live from New York, Peter Joseph. for inviting me, and uh, Steve Davis, who I'm sorry, uh, actually had surgery today, and he was going to come, and I told him that if he came, I would beat him up New York style. <laughs> I didn't even know what that meant, it just sounded right, and uh, so I said, all I want to know is that you're being pampered in bed. Uh, so uh, I want to thank um, uh, Light of Goods and uh, Michelle Miller, Katie Saltzman, um, Maggie and Lauren at the archive, uh, Jesse Lee Reese, Reese is on uh, camera, and I hear a child of God somewhere in the house, so don't say that uh, there's not a young audience for Cormac's work. <laughs> when I first began reading Cormac McCarthy at the urging of McCarthy's most prodigious promoter, my friend Rick Wallach, I responded to Rick's request that I deliver a talk at the first McCarthy conference by speaking about reading McCarthy's great Western novel, Blood Meridian, all of it, aloud, and replicating the quality of spit in the novel, an experiment that surely constituted the first marginalia of spit, about trying to spit like the depraved Lantern Gang, the unrivaled assortment of vigilante scalp hunters at the center of the novel I wrote the following. Not much of a champion spitter myself, I essayed different approaches, observing which, if any, felt or looked like blood meridian spits. I spat into sinks and toilet bowls and parking lots and railroad tracks and lawns. I spat out the door of my car. I walked on the beach and spat in the sand and into the water. I spat on stones and abandoned rusts of pipes and cranes. I spat into storm beach concrete cisterns. I spat in the wind. I spat in the woods. I spat in the rain. I spat in the town and in the city on Manhattan Avenues. I even tried spitting through my teeth the way that a boy, Bobby Reese, one of my heroes when I was six, used to spit from a great distance beautifully aimed precision streams wherever he wished. It was largely for this virtuoso spitting, along with a bearish talent for shimmying up trees, that I idolized this boy only. Here I was now still trying to spit like Bobby Reese, but in the cause of literature until it was pointed out to me that Reese could spit that way because of a space between his two front teeth. Still, I would not be contented until I had struck a spit worthy of blood meridian, the problem being that my spits were only about spit. An expressive spit commands a force behind it, a focus, a finding of target. It has aim. Did that, I wondered, partly derive from chewing tobacco? At the time of my spit researches, I had not yet spoken to Brad Dourif about his role in McCarthy and Richard Pierce's film, The Gardener's Son, during which conversation Brad and I talked about spit. It's all in the chewing tobacco, Brad told me. McCarthy loved the tobacco spitting. He just loved it. We used to talk about it, about the rhythm of it. It has a rhythm. I mean, it points things. Somebody say something, you go, and here Brad demonstrated, dryly but convincingly, it points things. Nice way of putting it. Chaw is mentioned in Blood Meridian, but no one is seen spitting it specifically. 
Tobacco, then, would be a presupposition, a pretty sure bet with these Old West psychopaths, but not a certainty. In any case, tobacco was not enough of an answer. Was the requisite here, perhaps, a long resistance to, dislike, and distrust of verbal effusion? Was Blood Meridian, then, a book of men for whom confusion and contempt could best be vented through the speechless forms of their own spit, or the draw of another's blood. Well, that's a sample of how I made my debut among scholars who were writing about McCarthy and the <laughs> philosophy of Jacques Derrida or René Girard. There I was exploring the profundities of spitting tobacco. As an artist with no academic affiliation, I was impressed that I was even allowed into the building. The fact that the super serious world of McCarthy scholarship welcomed this New York entertainer into its midst told me something about the sort of enthusiast drawn into the world of Cormac McCarthy. Once, when I wondered whether gatherings were all this welcoming elsewhere in the literary firmament, a former president of the Hemingway Society assured me that the Hemingway purple weren't nearly as much fun, and in fact <laughs> tended toward the querulous and the grumpy, decidedly not the camp for me. At that same first conference on the campus of Bellarmine College in Louisville, Kentucky, where incidentally McCarthy's as yet unproduced play, The Stonemason, is set, I also participated on more familiar footing as a man of the theater, where I directed myself and two other actors in readings from each of McCarthy's works. Those readings verified my intuition about the performative nature, both of McCarthy's dialogue and of his prose. Novelist Richard Marius, who gave the keynote address, attended those readings, and something extreme happened to him during a scene from McCarthy's greatest novel, Sutri, which is set in the poorer quarters of Knoxville. When Sutri helps his friend Leonard to bury his very long dead father by unceremoniously dumping him into the Tennessee River, Marius laughed so hard that he cried out one of his contact lenses. As Marius died young, it's nice to know that by channeling Sutri, we instigated one of the deeper laughs in his life. Fact is, if you tune into McCarthy's rhythms and inflections, if you embrace his Shakespearean talent for selecting the prime word for both its meaning and its tone as it trips off the tongue and vibrates in the bone, if you study his sense of humor so as not to miss one smile or one laugh, you discover that he really does read exquisitely. When Brad Pitt recorded an abridgment of McCarthy's sixth novel, All the Pretty Horses, in 1993, Pitt was 30 years old. He had a lean, youthful voice that sounded sad, even frail at times, and his understated reading rings right for its teenage hero, John Grady Cole, and young enough for all three of the boys in the novel. But that voice is just too young for the sonorous wisdom of McCarthy. For wisdom does arrive in different tones, and when McCarthy aims for the sonorous, he achieves it. I was not surprised to hear that McCarthy is not a fan of Pitt's reading. Pitt is a wonderful actor, and he does the best that he can playing the part of Westray in Whitley Scott's film of McCarthy's The Counselor, unfortunately a film that no actor could save. But narrating a book is not acting. It is a thing apart. Another weakness in Pitt's reading is that it is flatly monotonic and far too somber for McCarthy, who for all his achievements in violence, death, decay, is seldom what I think of as somber. McCarthy is, after all, an Irishman, no? If you read about the desolated, apocalyptic setting of his Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Road. It could strike you as exemplifying the somber, but when you read it, you see that it is lifted, elevated on every page. Why? It's McCarthy's genius at composing English sentences. It's English that has wings, the energy of flight. This is what's wrong with John Hillcote's film adaptation of The Road. 
It's respectful, true to the story, well acted, well shot. But it has no wings. It simply does not sing. Among the nice things about James Franco's lower budget adaptation of McCarthy's third novel, Child of God, is that it never loses its sense of humor or feels weighted by its subject, which is a backwoods killer who collects the corpses of women in a cave for romantic purposes. You try and keep that lifted. And somehow, Franco achieves it. McCarthy cannot be interpreted flatly because his narratives at their best are the opposite. Charles Darwin believed that music predated language. Will music outlast language? If it does, it will have to take word singer McCarthy along with it. Let me venture an example from All the Pretty Horses of how McCarthy's prose and his dialogue working together in counterpoint really sing off the page. This is after young John Grady and his best bud, Rollins, have escaped the dangerous safety of life in San Angelo and have crossed the Rio Grande with a younger boy, Blevins, who has attached himself to them along the way. The boys are now drunk on distilled desert spoon, so tall, and it is just about to rain up a storm. The storm front towered above them, and the wind was cool on their sweating faces. They slunk bleary-eyed in their saddles and looked at one another. Shrouded in the black thunderheads, the distant lightning glowed mutely like welding seen through foundry smoke, as if repairs were underway at some flawed place in the iron dark of the world. It's fake and come a good un, said Rollins. I can't be out, miss, said Blevins. Rollins laughed and shook his head. Listen at this, he said. Where do you think you're going to go, said John Grady. I don't know, but I got to get somewheres. Well, why can't you be out in it? On account of the lightning. Lightning? Yeah. Damn, if you don't look about halfway sober all of a sudden, said Rollins. You afraid of lightning, said John Grady. I'll be struck sure as the world. Rollins nodded at the canteen hung by its strap from the pommel of John Grady's saddle. Don't give him no more of that shit. It's coming down with the DTs. It runs in the family, said Blevins. My granddaddy was killed in a mine bucket in West Virginia, run down in the hole 180 feet to get him. They couldn't even wait for him to get to the top. They had to wait down the bucket to cool it before they could get him out of it. Him and two other men, it fried him like bacon. My daddy's older brother was blown out of a derrick in the Batson field in the year 1904. Cable rig with a wood derrick with a light and got him anyways. And him not 19 year old. Great uncle on my mother's side. Mother's side, I said. Got killed on a horse and it never singed a hair on that horse and it killed him. Ray got dead. They had to cut his belt off and wear it well with a buckle straw. And I got a cousin named but four years older than me was struck down in his own yard coming from the barn and paralyzed him all down one side and milk with the fillings in his teeth and sodded his jaw shut. I told you, said Rollins, he's gone completely dipshit. They didn't know what was wrong with him. He just twitched and mumbled and pointed his mouth like, that's an out, out live. I never heard one, said Rollins. Blevins didn't hear. Beads of sweat stood on his forehead. Another cousin on my daddy's side, it got him and set his hair on. The change in his pocket burned through and fell out on the ground and set the grass right. I done been struck twice. How come me to be deaf in this one ear? I'm double bred for death by fire. You got to get away from anything metal at all. You don't know what will get you. Brads in your overalls, nails in your boots. Well, what do you intend to do? He looked wildly toward the north. Try and outright it. Only chance I've got. Rawlins looked at John Grady. He leaned and spat. Spat. <laughs> well, if there's any doubt for I guess that ought to clear it up. You can't outride a thunderstorm, said John Grady. What the hell is wrong with you? It's the only chance I got. He no sooner said it than the first thin crack of thunder reached them no louder than a dry stick trod on. Blevins took off his hat and passed the sleeve of his shirt across his forehead and doubled the reins in his fist and took one last desperate look behind him and whacked the horse across the rump with the hat. He tried to get his hat on and then lost it. It rolled in the road. He went on with his elbows flapping and he grew small on the plain before them and more ludicrous yet. 
I ain't taking no responsibility for him, said Rollins. He reached and unhooked the canteen from John Grady's saddle horn and put his horse forward. He'll be laying in the road down here. Where do you reckon that horse will be? He rode on, drinking and talking to himself. I'll tell you where that horse will be. Run plumb out of the country. That's where. Gone to hell come Friday. That's where the goddamn horse will be. They rode on. There was spits of rain in the wind. Spits. <laughs> Blevins' hat lay in the road, and Rawlins tried to ride his horse over it, but the horse stepped around it. John Grady slid one boot out of the stirrup and leaned down and picked up the hat without dismounting. They could hear the rain coming down the road behind them like some phantom migration. Blevins' horse was standing saddled by the side of the road tied to a clump of willows. John Grady rode through the willows and down the arroyo following the occasional bare footprint until he came upon Blevins crouched under the roots of a dead cottonwood in a cave out where the arroyo turned and fanned out onto the plain. He was naked, save for an outsized pair of stained undershorts. The hell are you doing? said John Grady. Blevins sat gripping his thin white shoulders in either hand. Just sitting here? John Grady looked out over the plain where the last remnants of sunlight were being driven toward the low hills to the south. He leaned and dropped Blevins' hat at his feet. Where's your clothes at? I took them off. I know that. Where are they? I left them up yonder. Sure had brass snaps, too. <laughs> if this rain hits hard, there'll be a river come down through here like a train. You thought about that? You ain't never been struck by lightning. You don't know what it's like. Well, you'll get drowned sitting here. That's all right. I ain't never been drowned before. <laughs> I want to linger here to revisit one line that fascinates me as a revelation of character and by which we can see what a master of detail that we have in McCarthy. And by me, I am including, with emphasis, this campus, this library, and the McCarthy Archive in the Whitliffe collections right across the hall, where I steal as much time as I can. But when you graze in McCarthy's papers here, you unlock the door to his workshop. You lean over his shoulder. You watch him as he trims and embellishes and smartens and makes more music and emotional power out of his sentences a process emblemized by a note in the margin of a blood meridian manuscript, needs another trip into the mountains. Yes, Cormac, I agree. All of what we all write needs another trip into the mountains. <laughs> that would be my advice to those of you who are writers. Use the word mountains to mean wherever, whoever, whatever you're writing about and take another trip into the mountains. When my mountains were the streets of Paris, I walked them personally for 17 hours a day in order to write slightly better, slightly truer sentences. So now, if we look at one of McCarthy's sentences, I'll show you how I encourage my own uncertainty to lead me into exploring McCarthy's work in my own way. Here's the line. Blevins' hat lay in the road, and Rawlins tried to ride his horse over it, but the horse stepped around it. About the simple line I could have called a horse lady whom I met last year in a Long Island Starbucks. Instead, I wrote to Cormac's brother, Dennis, to Diane C. Luce, one of McCarthy's most respected commentators, and to Paulo Faria, McCarthy's prize-winning Portuguese translator. Here's what I said about the line. What does this mean? One. Rawlins wanted Junior, his horse, to tremble Blevins' hat. Two, Rawlins wanted Junior, his horse, to step over Blevins' hat. Even viewed from the horse's perspective, one can wonder whether A, the horse has been raised to have more respect than to trample or to step over a cowboy's hat, or B, the horse is so Rawlins and thus so disapproves of Blevins that he avoids his hat altogether out of a kind of self-protection or contempt. Dennis McCarthy responded this way. 
I don't have a copy of Forces Within Reach. Nonetheless, I will boldly assert that door number one is the answer. Rollins wanted Junior, his horse, to trample Blevins hat. Junior's character was unassailable. Rollins was assailable. But then Junior was a horse. Rollins was merely human. There's a horseman right there. Paul Ferrier, responding from Lisbon, said this. It was you, Peter, who taught me that the answers to questions raised by McCarthy's writings are always in his own books. In All the Pretty Horses and in The Crossing, horses seem reluctant about stepping on anything but the ground itself. From what I've read, a horse will not step on a person if it can avoid it, but Cormac's horses go further. They seem reluctant even to step on shadows. Quote, the horses stepped archly among the shadows that fell over the road. Horses, page 73. And stepping on a hat is something that makes them very nervous. Billy sawed his horse about the horse. Excuse me. Billy sawed his horse about and the horse stepped in the Jeffy's hat and turned and sent it skittering. The crossing, page 261. And only walking backwards will they step on a man. Cormac's horses are wild animals, thinly tamed, that avoid all contact with human beings and will only give in to someone who is something of a centaur himself, like John Brady Cole. Of course, all this argument falls apart when one reads in Blood Meridian, and the horses surged and milled and trampled underfoot the dead, or Glanton rode his horse completely through the first wiki of trampling the occupants underfoot. Here's what Diane Luce had to say. Peter, I know a little something of the character of horses, and I've always read this as Rollins attempting to make his horse step in the hat out of his own disdain for Blevins, and the horse, being a horse, its training has nothing to do with it, will not step on it. Horses have the good sense not to step on the unknown. Nothing in their genes knows from hats. <laughs> Well, by now you realize that I consulted these enthusiasts less to answer a question about a horse and a hat, more because, well, I just love to hear these people taking time out of the world of private and professional life to dive into the universe contained in a single sentence by one of the great prose poets of our day. There is no Rollins, there is no Blevins, there is no horse called Junior, there is no 10-gallon Texas hat lying in a drunken road in Mexico. All of this conversation is about a line of imagination on a page where McCarthy discovers all the humor, all the humanity, and since it's also about horses, I guess you could say the equinity, in a situation that leads eventually to Blevins getting himself shot to death. One reason I can shamelessly recommend my books on McCarthy is that I invite so many smart people into them. I mentioned Rick Wallach in San Antonio at the Menger Hotel, a location that figures in All the Pretty Horses. I invited Rick to speak to me on camera about Blood Meridian, but on condition that he do so from a bubble bath. Rick agreed to climb into a hotel tub. In fact, I published our talk under the title Blood Bath. <laughs> but with his own two conditions. He wanted me to shoot him with a plastic saxophone and a rubber ducky. These took me a full day to track down, but how can you argue about a couple of toy props when you were posing a large, brilliant man in a tub full of bubbles for an on-camera interview in praise of a masterpiece? Let me give you a brief example of what I got from my shopping troubles. I asked Rick how he discovered the novel. Here's his answer. I was in Australia in 1992 in conversation with a friend who was an Australian critic. We were discussing who they thought our best writers were, and he mentioned McCarthy. I was thrown. I thought he meant Mary McCarthy. I said, I didn't think she was all that good. He was shocked that I didn't know who Cormac McCarthy was. At this time, McCarthy was out of print in the United States. All the Pretty Horses was something of a whisper on the horizon. But he was quite in print in paperback in Australia. So I picked a copy of Blood Meridian off the wire rack of a newsstand in the drugstore of the Adelaide Railroad Station, and I read it overnight on the GAN. 
a wonderful train that runs from Adelaide to Alice Springs. I sat up with it all night. I was flabbergasted. I finished the book as a blood-red sun was coming up in the east. Boy, it was an experience. Why, exactly? Well, for one thing, it was delirious to see the mythology of the heroic cowboy overturned. It was gratifying to see the barbarism and cruelty of Euro-American genocide against Native American populations so fearlessly and unblinkingly depicted. As horrible as the scenes were, it was tonic to see that someone was doing it so brilliantly and not ameliorating the moral sentence upon the act. I found that startling. And it was remarkable that I should be reading this book in Australia on the eve of the first Australian law that granted integrity of territorial ownership back to its own Aboriginal people. That occurred the week that I discovered Blood Meridian in Australia. So from my perspective, there was irony in that. And of course, the gorgeous language, the cadences, the rhythmicity of it, and the remarkable words. Words are wonderful things. Words are like uncut unpolished stones, still very beautiful before you apply the lapidary art to them. And McCarthy seemed to have gone on his hands and knees on a beach strewn with the most spectacular words and picked them off and buffed them with his denim shirt and put them in his pocket and taken them home and worked them perfectly into the foil of his narrative. At this point, I have no idea why I needed Rick to be soaking in a tub. Who knows, perhaps I wanted to prove that one can deeply engage literature from a viewpoint lower than the proverbial ivory tower. There's a very large character called the judge in Blood Meridian, and Rick, too, is monstrous large, so perhaps I was aiming for some kind of visual parallel. Rick, who is both a genius and a rogue, wanted the saxophone and the rubber ducky so that he could work into the conversation a song from Sesame Street. You've got to put down the ducky if you want to play the saxophone. But Rick was so engrossed in praising McCarthy that when I gave him his cue and asked him to compare the craft of writing with learning the saxophone, he looked at me dumbly and said, I don't know, I'm not sure writing is analogous to music. <laughs> I had to cue him three times before he remembered the plastic sacks and the rubber ducky on the ledge of the tub. <laughs> Let me share one more example of why it excites me to invite all this intelligence into my work. While I was shooting Acting McCarthy, the making of Billy Bob Thornton's All the Pretty Horses, I spoke to nearly everyone involved in the filming of that novel, including Matt Damon, Bruce Dern, Henry Thomas, Billy Bob himself, and Julio Michoso, who plays Captain Raul in the film. The captain is the Mexican cop who, without due process, executes Blevins for killing two men while retrieving the horse that ran from him in the rainstorm we read about earlier. Speaking to me in his home in Los Angeles, Julio exemplified the way that a fine actor conjoins his own life with that of his character. <clears throat> In the book, Julio said, there's a beautiful long story I would love to have used. It's where the captain says, listen, when I was a kid, there were all these kids playing at this big party. We went to do a prostitute on top of the hill. When I went there with my friends, I was the smallest of the group. The prostitute laughed at me like, you're a little kid, what are you going to do? I thought, well, I can go back down the hill and say I've had her. But no, people will know the truth in your face. And you know what? When I walked down that hill, nobody laughed at me, OK? I told Matt and Billy, this is central to this character. I know this guy. I grew up in poor neighborhoods. When I come down that hill, nobody laughs, all right? And you know what? They can tell the truth in your face. So the whole neighborhood will know. If I don't kill that kid, Blevins, everybody in that town is going to know, and I'm not the captain anymore. What, a gringo got the better part of you? You let him go, what, are you afraid of the United States? And so then I tell somebody, hey, you can't keep your sheep here anymore. And they say, what, a gringo came here, killed two of us? You didn't do shit about it? It's got to be paid with blood. 
I've had some tough times. My neighborhood, Little Havana, around the Orange Bowl, the people I hung around with, they were not easy people. This guy was well written. And then that prison brother, you know how many prisons I've been in? I work for the criminal justice department. I used to go from prison to prison. Prisons are not populated by our best human beings in Mexico or the United States. History is full of characters like this. He didn't enjoy killing that kid, not on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level. He felt good that he did it because his tribe expects that of him. We've only been living in cities for the last 5,000 years. We used to belong to a tribe of 50 to 100 people. He's the chief of his tribe, and that's his responsibility, enforce the laws of his tribe. And you know what, Blevins? He's one of those kids I grew up with, just trouble, okay? When I went to a place, I was looking to have fun. There were always one or two guys that were just looking for trouble. So when the trouble starts, now you're obligated, like Matt's character, to do something for that member of your tribe. We always said, hey, our guy's always right, okay? Afterwards, you count someone. Hey, don't do that again, that's stupid. Which I'm sure they wanted to do, but they stick with him because they have that tribal bond. That I think Cormac understands. That's human nature, brother. That's not Mexican and American. That's almost anywhere in the world. If we're in an argument, we're going to defend our tribe against the others. And I see that Cormac is in contact with human nature. I think the captain was satisfied in that little town. These guys come in. They're making his job a lot harder. You ride into my town, you kill two people just because you want your horse back? No, you come to see me. Maybe I can do something about it. And this kid, Levins, he was no choir boy, okay? What, he's a good boy, then he comes here and he does bad? No, he was always a bad boy. You see how he shoots? The way he killed those people, he's a good shot. Don't you think I know that? What, you think just because I'm a Mexican captain, I don't know who knows how to kill and who doesn't? That kid was a badass. Yes, his father beat him up when he was a kid. Usually badasses are that way. They have a story too. Or kid might have been beaten with a switch. I don't know how many times. That doesn't give you an excuse to come into my town and do any deeds. And I know people that he killed. You don't think I know them? Horse shows up. Hey, what the fuck? It's mine. The gun also. Hey, I found it in the road. One thing about that book, it's not black and white. If you read that book carefully, it's not that the captain is really that bad and everybody else is good. I like that ambiguity. That's what makes great writers. It's all these shades. The captain likes John Grady. He respects this kid a lot, but if the captain had to kill him, he would kill him too, you know? It's like the old man in the sea. Fish, I love you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> or the last of the Mohicans, when they kill that deer, deer, I'm sorry I killed you, but we're going to eat tonight. Julio was gold for my documentary, but I was equally pleased to be sitting face to face with an interpreter of McCarthy who made the word flesh with such a deeply personal commitment. I was a few feet away from a very real incarnation of Captain Raoul, so you could say that I was treated to my own private version of the book and of the film, a viewing I was then able to share as a filmmaker myself and as a writer. Speaking to Julio was just one of the many ways I have adventured into the world, both as an artist and as a man, with the prospect of making McCarthy's great achievement an integral part of my own life. But let me close by giving you a taste of the part that I played in Danville, Kentucky this past January, the part of White in the Sunset Limited, McCarthy's two-man play about a New York professor who leaps in front of a subway and is rescued by a man named Black, who takes White to his Harlem apartment where Black, a religious man living amongst drug addicts, struggles to convince White to live. Before I do, is a concrete example of what can happen when you utilize the papers in this great Whitliffe collection. As an actor, I was not energized by the reasons White gives for trying to kill himself, so I invented my own secret subtext in which one of White's former students had had an affair with him, then dumped him. One day, 
Here in the archive, I found an early draft of the play in which White talks about a woman with whom he might have had a relationship, but then she killed herself. So, there it was, a woman in White's past who was never once mentioned in the finished play, other than perhaps one line about wanting forgiveness for something he never reveals. All right, here's the scene. Just before White breaks away from Black with the promise to really do it this time, he delivers his mind to Black in what my director called White's exit aria. For it was a big theater and I needed to deliver the speech largely. I decided to make Black and the audience interchangeable. So for a few minutes now, this evening, you will be my partner in the play. You have to promise me, though, not to imitate White by coming to New York and leaping into the subway. If you do come to New York, send me an email and have a nice, quiet, life-affirming espresso. <laughs> so, Black begs White, finally, to tell him how he really feels about the world. Despite that, it's pretty much agreed between them that uh, it's going to be upsetting for Black to hear this, uncensored, unmitigated. Black basically convinces White that it's something he needs to hear, despite the fact that uh, he doesn't really care to hear it and uh, could be life-changing for him at such a crucial moment where he's trying to save someone's life. <clears throat> so, White agrees. Okay, maybe you're right. Well, here's my news, Reverend. I yearn for the darkness. I pray for death, real death. But if I thought that in death I'd meet the people I've known in life, I don't know what I'd do. That would be the ultimate horror, the ultimate despair. If I had to meet my mother again and start all of that all over, only this time without the prospect of death to look forward to, <laughs> that would be the final nightmare. Kafka on wheels. I told you this would upset you. I want the dead to be dead forever, and I want to be one of them, except, of course, you can't be one of them. You can't be one of the dead, for what has no existence can have no community. No community. My heart warms just thinking about it. Silence, blackness, aloneness, peace, all of it only a heartbeat away. Let me finish. I don't regard my state of mind as some pessimistic view of the world. I regard it as the world itself. Evolution cannot avoid bringing intelligent life ultimately to an awareness of one thing above all else, and that one thing is futility. If people saw the world for what it truly is, so their lives for what they truly are, I don't believe they could offer a first reason why they should not elect to die as soon as possible. I don't believe in God. Can you understand that? Look around you, man. Can't you see the clamor and din of those in torment? Has to be the sound most pleasing to his ear. And I loathe these discussions. The argument of the village atheist whose single passion is to revile endlessly that which he denies the existence of to begin with. Your fellowship is a fellowship of pain and nothing more. Enough that pain were actually collected instead of simply reiterative. The sheer weight of it would drag the world from the walls of the universe and send it crashing and burning through whatever night it might yet be capable of engendering until it was not even ash. And justice, brotherhood, eternal life, good God, man. Show me a religion that prepares one for death, for nothingness. There's a church I might enter. Yours prepares one only for more life, with dreams and illusions and lies. If you could banish the fear of death from men's hearts, they wouldn't live a day. Who would want this nightmare if not for fear of the next? The shadow of the axe hangs over. Every joy, every road ends in death, or worse, every friendship, every love, torment, betrayal, suffering, illness, indignity, all with a single conclusion for you, 
everyone, everything you have ever cared for. There's the true fellowship, the true brotherhood, and everyone is a member for life. You say that my brother is my salvation, my salvation? Then damn him. Damn him in every shape and form and guise. Do I see myself in him? Yes, I do. And what I see sickens me. Your God must have once stood in a dawn of infinite possibility. This is what he's made of it. And now it is drawing to a close. You say that I want God's love? I don't. Perhaps I want forgiveness, but there is no one to ask it of. There is no going back. There is no setting things right. Perhaps once, not now. Now there is only the hope of nothingness. I cling to that hope. Now open the door, please. Open the door. Don't open it yet. I'm going to take a drink of water and we'll do some questions. <laughs> <in the next. laughs> the archive, um, I know that sounds like he's ready to go out and do it again, but I found a draft of the Sunset Limited written as a novel. It started as a novel called The Black, and it's written in the first person by White. Oh. Okay, so, you know, uh, you don't know what might have happened when he went back to his uh, apartment. He might have found an opening there, something that transpired between him and uh, Black. Uh, so, uh, you know, another revelation. It's interesting because I always felt that uh, I never was really convinced that he was going to do it again. It was over with. He tried, he was saved, and I mean, why miss the opportunity to break these guys' balls that are trying to save him? Um, and that's one way of playing it. It's a, it's a fascinating role uh, to undertake, and it's an interesting experience. When you're on stage, you are actually a um, McCarthy character. You know, that's about, as, that's about as into it as you can get. That's it. You know, you're, you're the guy for that time. And there's really no getting it right. You just, you know, you perform all these experiments. Um, I rehearsed it alone before I even had the gig, before I even knew there was a production. Uh, I learned the lines and I decided, well, the worst that happens is I'll just go to the 155th Street subway station, uh, somebody will uh, grab me, and I'll know it's a safe for an hour and a half. <laughs> but I, but I did get the, we did get an equity production in, in Danville, Kentucky, and it was great, so that didn't have to happen. Um, I need to hear some, uh, uh, some of your experiences with, with McCarthy's work. Mark, this is Mark Busby. Well, I'm, most of you know. Um, let me ask you my question very quickly. I'm wondering how many times you spat when you were doing quiet in that production. <laughs> do you want me to answer your question? And, and that was how I got started on McCarthy? Yes, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'm like, uh, like Rick, I was fairly, fairly late in the process. And uh, I mean, some people like, like Bill Whitliff here, who read Blood Meridian when it was, uh, he was one of the 12 people who bought a copy when it was published, I think. Uh, but I came late, and, uh, and uh, it was all the pretty horses that uh, opened it for a lot of people when that book came out. And I picked it up and read it. Um, as someone who had grown up with a great uh, love of Faulkner, and someone who writes those sentences with those words I mean, Rick's description of those gems that are placed and polished is a magnificent description of, of uh, the language of McCarthy, and yet sometimes that language, and this is the, one of the great appeals, is that this brilliant language is describing the most awful things, the dead babies and trees and so forth, and it's this, it's this disjunction that somehow leads the, leads the reader 
this, uh, in this space, somewhere in between revulsion and, and love. Uh, How has it been teaching uh, McCarthy? You have, a, you have some, I believe, graduate students or, uh, yeah. that are focusing on McCarthy. Could you just talk about that for a few minutes? Yeah, and I'll ask my question about that it, it, uh, when I get through. It, and it's, it's a, uh, I think, an up and down experience. There are a number of students who come to McCarthy with you know, blank slates, and without a sense of how they're going to respond. And there are many who respond like, like uh, you and I probably did with this, this uh, great interest and keen response to them. And there are others who don't want to read another word ever. You know, that, um, that it's too dark, it is, it is too awful, and I don't want to go back there again. Um, so there are those, those polls. Here's my question. This class is beginning uh, Blood Meridian just now. You've been with Blood Meridian for a long time, and I just wondered how your attitudes about, uh, about Blood Meridian have changed over the time that you've spent since maybe you first, you first read it, and, uh, and now how you might think of it. I'm glad you asked me that because I've discovered something really devious about McCarthy's work. And the most important thing that I can say about Blood and Meridian illustrates this deviousness. Um, if you read one of his greatest works, such as Blood Meridian, or to my mind, an even greater work, Setri, which uh, we were just discussing this today, and I said that I think it is the most uh, inebriating and life-affirming novel by an American. Uh, comparable maybe to, you know, Tropic of Cancer or Huck Finn, but there really is nothing like it. It's, it's so unique that it's kind of an entity in and of itself, as is Blood Meridian. It's, you know, it's, it's more than just a novel, it's an event in your life, and an event in the culture. And what his best books have in common, I think it's true of Child of God also, I'm rereading uh, the Orchard Keeper now. Um, I'm not sure how he does this. It's a trickster thing that he does. Um, he probably has some ancient medicine, ancient ma magic, you know, um, perhaps of Native American origin. But he manages to add uh, extraordinarily beautiful sequences that were not in the novel the last time that you read it. And I don't understand how he does that because it's been on my shelf for two years, three years, five years. But it happens all the time. They, and you have to trust me on this, they were not there the last time that I read them. You know, when I was in first grade, I, I came down with the measles and so I was out for a couple of weeks. And when I came back, I realized they had changed my teacher on me. And no one would believe it, no one in the class, my parents, my brother. Um, but because of that, I know that these trickster things can happen. <laughs> and, and so it's interesting that, uh, to really accurately answer your question, uh, I can't get to a point where I'm reading the same book again, because it shifts and it changes, so that it's always new. I mean, I mean, really new, too. You know, when I read a book that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, you know, that is life-changing for me. I mentioned Tropic of Cancer, for example. I not only remember the last time that I read it, but I remember a lot from the very first time that I read it. Um, and that's true for all of McCarthy's works. And so I can verify this tricksterism by the last reading and the first reading. And it's, it's always new. Um, so I think he needs to be confronted about that. Uh, there's yet to be the... A writers at Work Paris Review interview with Cormac McCarthy, and someone uh, needs to accomplish that. <laughs> but I doubt that it's going to happen uh, with anyone. We need some more comments, please. Just uh, I know most of you have read some of his work, so um, yes. Why don't you? Do you have fear of microphone or dislike of microphone? I'm very. 
and he doesn't talk to anybody. I mean, how did he come into writing, and has he always been a writer? I mean, Mark, talk about that a little. The, the recluse <laughs> side to you. Well, he's not a recluse. Uh, he doesn't go on uh, Jimmy Fallon, although that'd be an interesting gig, I would think. Uh, but uh, I had a friend, a uh, uh, writer from Austin, Stephen Harrigan, who went out to read Gates of the Alamo um, a, a decade ago in El Paso when the notion that McCarthy was this recluse. Uh, you know, hiding out in the house that's on the cover of Peter's new book. Uh, and uh, Stephen was flabbergasted that Carmack was in the audience and uh, there to hear him read. Uh, and uh, Dagoberto Gilb, who talked here for a long time, so would say the same thing, you know, hey, if I want to see uh, Carmack, I'd just go down to Barnes & Noble, you know, I mean, he was, he was there, you know, he'd come out, he wasn't reclusive. And watch him on Oprah, you know, he's a... Uh, you know, he's a little munchkin in that chair, but he is, uh, you know, he doesn't seem uncomfortable at all. But uh, his background is uh, University of Tennessee, the Air Force, for several years, and then he went back and won several writing awards and set out to win all of these, these uh, Guggenheims and, and various fellowships. Uh, and uh, Saul Bellow described him as the best unknown writer in America uh, right before all the pretty horses changed that. We'll take uh, maybe enough, one more question. Yeah, thank you. Um, it seems like maybe one thing within his work that I've discerned is is that you know we as humans, we as deciding beings, are, are given very we're given a lot of gifts. You know, uh, no country for old men. We may be given a large cache of money. You know, on the road, we may be given a, a Coca Cola. Um, the you know the Comanches and and the cowboys are given horses, which is a terrible. A, a, terrible weapon in itself, besides the, you know, the, the killing weapons that they have. We're given these gifts, and e each of the characters um, comes to this fork in the road, and, and what they do with these gifts doesn't turn out well, often. Um, is this any sort of a metaphor for, for do, you think, do you think this is a larger thing to his work or not? It's just, it's my my own approach to it is, is, you know, what what is this gift and why is it so terrible, I guess? All I can say is that it makes perfect sense. What he just said. <laughs> no, I, I, I do think that it's a theme. Um, and it relates to, I think, a, a, another motif in his work, which is how much control you think that you have over your future. And you see that in in, in minor details in his books, and you see that in the overall arc of a story. There's, a, it, it, there's, there's often, a, a, to give an example, in, in, um, in his second novel, Out of Dark, there's a guy who's running a ferry, and he's just blathering on about how proficient he is, and how safe it is, and how he knows what he's doing, and two seconds later, he's in the water, and he's dead. I mean, in that, in the sense, is a is a you know is a microscopic version of what you see uh, in the counselor. You see it in No Country for Old Men. Uh, you see it quite often in Blood Meridian, where the authorities, those in power, the military, the police, and so forth, um, they're used to having uh, a little bit of influence when someone rolls into town, and uh, they have none. And I, and I get the sense that there's something in McCarthy that loves that. He loves that kind of unbridled power as a literary motif, because you see it everywhere. Um, he loves to, to, to demonstrate that, uh, that pretension, that we can do it, you know? We've learned enough, we've seen enough, we're cultivated enough, we're civilized enough, of course, it's interesting because history doesn't bear that out. Otherwise, we, we you know, we wouldn't still be warring the way that we do. When we, um, but individually, we kind of like to, uh, kind of like to think that. In a way, that's part of what happens in the Sunset Movement. At this tiny little play with these two guys, he's a man of God, a man who says that in the morning he grabs hold of Jesus' belt, 
before he goes through the course of his day. And it's clear that um, this is a crisis for him because he always believed that if he had to save a man's life the way he felt he was saving White's life that morning, he would have the right words. And at the very end, he says, um, he didn't give me the words. You gave them to him. Why didn't you give them to me? <laughs> Um, so all of you who are writers, keep writing, and those of you who are interested in McCarthy, please do. Just You don't have to be a specialist, you don't have to be an academic. Just go into the archive, um, tell them when you're coming, and what you might be interested in seeing. Um, and if you uh, sit down, I can promise you, with a single box of McCarthy's papers, uh, you'll want to come back again, because it's... Um, I also often tell scholars who haven't been here yet, or readers, uh, you'll think that you're going to go through three boxes dealing with a uh, blood meridian in the course of a day, and you'll wind up spending eight hours on just one folder, because you're jotting down everything, and you put a little slips in for when you want Xeroxes, and you realize Holy shit, I'm copying the entire folder. <laughs> just want all of this stuff and take it home with me. But you can't do that, so you have to keep coming back. Okay, thanks for coming. You've been great. Appreciate it.